The story of Earth's climate history is long, and in a planetary sense, remarkably stable. If we examine other planetary bodies in our solar system, we can see examples of extreme variability, both in space, where average temperatures on the moon can range from minus 200 degrees Celsius on one side to plus 200 degrees Celsius on the other, and in time, where average surface temperatures on a young Venus may have been similar to Earth, while its current average surface temperature is nearly 500 degrees Celsius. In contrast, we believe that since the formation of the moon and the end of the period of asteroid bombardment over 4 billion years ago, the average temperature on Earth's surface has ranged between about 0 and 50 degrees Celsius. While Earth is remarkably good at homeostasis, or maintaining stability as it were, this is not to say that Earth's climate history is boring. In fact, it has been quite dynamic, and the changes it has produced have had significant impacts on habitability and life history of everything on our planet, as we will see. In general, when we talk about climate change, we refer to global temperatures. And the reason for this is that changes in temperature tend to be what drives other impacts like shifting distributions of precipitation, sea level rise, and increases in extreme weather events, just to name a few. Earth's surface temperature is primarily controlled by the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and how well they trap heat. While water vapor and other trace gases are important in this process, the primary driver of changes on Earth, regardless of time scale, appears to be carbon dioxide. We can imagine then that there are a few major levers or controls on Earth's climate system that operate via the active carbon cycle. Volcanism and the oxidation of organic matter release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and therefore drive warming, while silicate rock weathering and carbon burial remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and therefore drive cooling. Thus, throughout Earth's history, the relative balance of these forcings has largely controlled global climate and so far maintained a habitable but dynamic world. As one might imagine, in order to measure or predict modern and future climate change, we need to have quantitative records of past climate change on long timescales. Because we cannot take a thermometer with us back in time and measure paleo temperatures during the Jurassic, for instance, we have to use a combination of geologic archives known as proxies and global climate models in order to estimate what Earth's climate looked like before our observational record began, globally around the year 1900. These proxies include things like air bubbles trapped in major ice caps, the size and consistency of growth rings in trees, the chemical composition of marine microfossils, and the shape and abundance of various plant and tetrapod fossils. Models use geologic records of geography, atmospheric chemistry, and planetary physics, as well as modern observations of climate processes to approximate the global system. Together, these techniques allow us to reconstruct the climate history of Earth since its formation and provide relatively high resolution throughout the Phanerozoic Eon, spanning the last roughly 550 million years, and including the existence of all large-scale or macroscopic life forms. By now, you may have seen examples of observational records of climate change, spanning the last 150 years or so and have probably also seen projections of change over the next hundred or so years. It's important to place these records within the overall context of Earth's climate history, however. So if we zoom out and look at those proxy and model records of the last 550 million years, we can see that the planet has certainly experienced climate change on a large scale many times. On these long timescales, paleoclimatologists, or people who study past climate, tend to categorize climate states into greenhouse or icehouse conditions, with some additional distinctions for degree. Generally, greenhouse periods are characterized by warm conditions with high concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, double or perhaps more of our current concentrations, and a lack of continental ice sheets or major glaciers. Ice house conditions, on the other hand, tend to be cooler, with low concentrations of carbon dioxide and the presence of significant ice in parts of our world, like our modern Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. Global climate has shifted between these states at various points, and may at some points have even approached what we consider runaway conditions on either end, or effectively the threshold at which our planet becomes either permanently ice-covered, known as snowball Earth, or permanently superheated, 
known as hothouse Earth, which is similar to the conditions on Venus. Within the overall record, we can also note some particular trends of interest, like the significant cooling during the late Paleozoic, around 300 million years ago, the extreme warming at the beginning of the Cenozoic, around 55 million years ago, and the overall cooling and alternating trend that we see during the Quaternary, or the last couple million years. The cooling trend around 300 million years ago is usually called the Late Paleozoic Ice House and was characterized by a gradual drawdown of atmospheric carbon dioxide to near modern levels and consequent cooling of global climate to the point where large ice sheets formed across much of what is now Antarctica, Australia, Africa, and South America. This global cooling is actually particularly interesting because it was likely mostly driven by organisms. This time period is when plants first evolved on land and began dominating our continents, which had two key impacts on the carbon cycle. First, they expanded and grew huge amounts of biomass. They extracted carbon dioxide, or plant food, from the atmosphere and sequestered it both in their living matter and in sedimentary rocks as they died and got buried. Second, they actually started to induce strong rock weathering on our continents by breaking up soils and moving around water with their roots and actually acidifying soils with organic compounds and respiration. Effectively, they pushed down hard on both of our levers for removing carbon from the atmosphere, and as a result, caused a significant cooling to the point where our continents, which happened to be near the South Pole at the time, could produce substantial glacial environments. Eventually, this turned out to be a self-limiting feedback, and conditions later warmed again, but not before significantly changing global ecosystems and altering our climate for tens of millions of years. On the flip side of this is the extreme warming that occurred 55 million years ago at the beginning of the Cenozoic, the period called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, or PETM. Instead of a gradual process, this event is known as a hyperthermal, or a rapid warming event, that occurred over the course of about 20,000 years due to the combination of already relatively warm global conditions and perhaps aided by some bursts of volcanic activity in the Atlantic Ocean, a huge amount of frozen methane was released from its geologic repository on the seafloors and was added to the atmosphere. This volcanic and oxidized organic carbon basically pushed our climate levers in the opposite direction, causing carbon dioxide concentrations to shoot up to five times our modern values generating extreme warming in the range of 5 to 10 degrees Celsius. These warm conditions lasted for hundreds of thousands of years and caused major acidification and extinctions in our oceans, die-offs of forests and the clearing of ecosystems on land, and may have even caused the dwarfing and evolutionary splits in mammal groups like horses and primates. Overall, the PETM had extreme impacts worldwide, and records of the event have been found on every continent. And because it is the most rapid climate change event ever found in the geologic record, occurring over roughly 20,000 years, it is commonly used as an analog or natural experiment for modern and future climate change, which is occurring over less than 100 years. The Quaternary period spans the last few million years of Earth's history and is important in a climate sense, but also in terms of human evolution and the creation of what we consider modern ecosystems and environments. Broadly speaking, this period is considered an ice house, with major continental ice sheets in our polar regions. But throughout this period, we also have ice ages, which are short time spans when these continental ice sheets expand and actually grow well into our more temperate parts of our planet, extending across most of what is now the northern United States. Relatively low concentrations of carbon dioxide in our pre-industrial atmosphere resulted from substantial rock weathering in the growing Himalaya and Andes mountain ranges and allowed for orbital cycles of our planet to influence our climate more strongly. These orbital cycles, which basically control the distribution of solar radiation on Earth's surface as we move through space, created the muted pattern of warming and cooling that we see throughout the Quaternary period that led us into and out of ice ages. Within this context of relatively cool climates, large ice sheets, and low sea levels, modern ecosystems, including humans, evolved and adapted to gradual cycles of limited change. Humans, and the environments we live in and rely on, have only ever known ice house conditions. 
This brings us back to our observational record. In the context of these past records of Earth's climate, we can start to understand future predictions of climate change and maybe consider things like the magnitudes and rates of change our world has encountered. If we compare our current observations of change and the various future change scenarios developed by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, with some of these events from the geologic record, we can see that the total magnitude of change expected for some of our high emissions or continued inaction scenarios actually line up quite well with the degree of severity experienced in the past. This should be both comforting in terms of the science and concerning in terms of the impacts. However, when we compare our future scenarios to past events in terms of the rate of change or how quickly impacts from climate change were felt, we can see that the current rate of climate change is somewhere between 1,000 times on the low end and 10,000 times on the high end, faster than any of the previous climate change events that we can see in the geologic record. So overall, the take home messages from the ancient climate record are the facts that one, Earth's climate has changed before mostly as a result of changing carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Two, past changes in climate have increased and decreased global temperatures, and both have had significant and long-lasting impacts on life and our planet. And three, we are currently changing the climate faster than has ever been recorded in our 4.5 billion year history.